Okay, so Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. Because of my loud groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake, I have become like a bird alone on a roof. All day long my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. For I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with my tears. Because of your great wealth. For you have taken me up and thrown me aside. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will arise and have compassion on Zion. For it is time to show favour to her. The appointed time has come. For her stones are dear to your servants. Her very dust moves them to pity. The nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the kings of the earth will revere your glory. For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Let this be written for a future generation. That a people not yet created may praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned to death. So the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem when the peoples and their kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord. In the course of my life he broke my strength. He cut short my days. So I said... Do not take me away. Oh my God, in the midst of my days, your years go on through all generation. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them. And they will be discarded. But you remain the same. Your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. Amen. The psalmist says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Has that ever been your prayer? Have you ever prayed in such a way? It's a prayer of real sounding like desperation. Let my cry for help come to you. You prayed in such a way. What were you praying for? Were you praying for family? Were you praying for a personal situation? Were you praying because you were struggling with a a particular sin or a particular temptation? Was it a cry that you wanted to walk more closely with the Lord? It says at the top of this psalm that it's a prayer of an afflicted man when he is faint and pours out his lament before the Lord. He says in verses 4 and 5, his heart is blighted and withered like grass. He forgets to eat his food because of his loud groaning. He's reduced to skin and bones. Surely is the state of one who's in deep, deep distress. And yet when you read verse 10, you see that it's the Lord who's caused it. Because of your great wrath, for you have taken me up and thrown me aside. What has happened to him ultimately is the Lord's doing. Yet he doesn't dispute... The justice of God. 
Instead, what he does is he cries for relief. And there's a sense in which, on a personal level, that applies to every one of us, doesn't it? When we come to understand the wrath of God that is hanging over us, who are we to raise our fist and say, Why me? Why is this happening to me? Rather, we like the psalmist. We see, as Jeff has prayed and as we've sung in our hymns, when we see that false and full of sin I am, all unrighteousness, and all we can do, like the psalmist, is cry out for relief. But what is he seeking? Is he seeking a relief in the concept, that in, a, in a sense, is he seeking a relief from poverty? Is he wanting the Lord to bless him with riches? Is it some kind of um, physical illness he's experiencing? Is it that he wants um, an end to attack? People are attacking him and he wants that to be stopped. When you read verse 8, you read that there's a measure of truth in that because all day long my enemies taunt me. Rile against me. They use my name as a curse. And so clearly, that is part of his thought, part of what he wants relief from. But I would put it to you this morning that it's actually not a a prayer for a personal vindication or personal relief of a person who's perhaps been afflicted with an illness, been blighted in some way like Job. But it's more. The voice of one crying out for, not himself, but for another. But I would suggest, before you think that I'm talking about a nation, I would suggest it's not the nation of Israel. It's not a people that he's crying out for. It is Zion. It is Jerusalem. That he's crying out for. What was Jerusalem? What was Zion? City with a temple. Zion was one of the hills. And it was a hill that the temple was built on. And Jerusalem of course was uh, the city. And now it would seem it lies in ruins. You read verse 14. Her stones are dear to your servants. Her very dust moves them to pity. Now that doesn't suggest that it's all been crashed to the ground. But the fact that it's, he's speaking about it being rebuilt, rebuilt says yes that it is. Then he says in verse 16. The Lord will rebuild Zion. And so I would suggest to you that what he's talking about. What he's crying out for is the rebuilding of Zion. The rebuilding of Jerusalem. And it's written in such a way that when you read those verses, the first part of it, it's almost as if Jerusalem itself is crying out. It's almost um, a, a plural voice, as it were. Many voices raised as one. As though the psalmist is speaking on behalf of Jerusalem. All day long my enemies taunt me. You read the history and you see that that was the very thing that happened. That the enemies of Jerusalem would taunt at the people of Jerusalem. And would taunt and would uh, laugh at them as it were when they seemed and appeared to be struggling. Can't be sure. But it seems to suggest the way it's wording and what's being spoken of here, that it was most likely written sometime in the 6th century before Christ. And written at a time when Jerusalem itself had been destroyed. Written at a time when a temple had been raised to the ground. Written at a time when the, um, the, 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 the vast majority of the people had been carried off into captivity, taken into Babylon. And that was was something that happened in the 6th century. And so if we set our thoughts, our gaze to around that kind of period, after the destruction, that would seem to me to suggest when this psalm was written. And it would make sense with all that is being um, asked of here, all that is being spoken of here in 
this psalm. Now, if you go to Canterbury, I think Canterbury's probably, I haven't been to Canterbury for a while. I know someone works in Canterbury, but when I lived and worked in Canterbury, there was lots of Canterbury that didn't look very nice because um, it had been bombed extensively in the war, and so much of old Canterbury had been destroyed. And when there was not much money around in the 50s and the 60s, these kind of prefab type buildings had been put up, and it looked a bit of a mess, the centre of Canterbury, but I believe. Um, it's un, it's uh, in more affluent times. It's gone through a revamp, and perhaps it looks nicer again. I don't know. But there are elements of Canterbury, not least the cathedral, of course, that still stand and remind us of a former era, of former times. And if you go to York, which has been left untouched, you look at the streets of York and the city of York. It's a beautiful city, and first time I went there, it made me think. Well, that's probably what Canterbury would have been like before the Blitz, before the Second World War, before it was destroyed by bombs and such like. But in fact, history, culture, nostalgia, the old ways, if that's all that matters concerning Zion, concerning Jerusalem, then I would suggest it matters not. It doesn't really matter whether Canterbury is restored or has been restored like it once was. It matters to the uh, person who likes the old ways. It matters perhaps to the, uh, the culturalist and so on. It doesn't really matter, does it? In the Second World War, again, if you had a wireless, as it would have been called then, and you tuned it into the right channel, you could be in various places in the world and you would hear London calling, London calling, or you might hear, this is London I don't know, but whenever I've uh, um, heard that on, say, a film or something, it, it sort of fills you with a measure of pride that, you know, there's a, a strength and a stability and a calm about things. Though all the world is in turmoil, though the uh, Nazi war machine seems to be going everywhere, it's not going to get London. London will stand. London will stand forever. Sort of... You know, the hope, the heart, the seat of the nation is there. And it fills one, I'm sure it filled many people with this sense of hope. But it's not the, a, a mere physical city, like a, a stands as a symbol of Jewish power, or the power of Jerusalem. It's not merely as a, a physical city that the psalmist is concerned about. What matters to the psalmist? What matters to him here in this so, Jerusalem, we might say, Zion, we might say, is symbolic of the Lord's presence. The glory of the Lord would fill the tabernacle. And surely the temple that was the more solid foundation replacing the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord, is symbolic of the presence of the Lord. So, ask an Israelite, what do you think of when you think of Jerusalem? presence of the Lord. But I would suggest to you that it's more than that. More than a mere symbol of the presence of the Lord. If you watch certain films, it's uh, quite amazing really that uh, an army can be annihilated and yet those who remain all they're concerned about is a standard. You mustn't lose the standard. The standard stands for the regiment or the standard stands for the might of the British Empire. And so I remember watching one film with my boys and the, the ridiculous sight of someone, I mean for him it was great because it gave him an opportunity to escape, but he was given one of the remaining horses and the standard to try to gallop to freedom, to save the colours, save the standard. And all around him everyone perished. But this one man, he must, he must survive. Why? In a sense it's like a symbol of the British Empire. Unconquerable, isn't it? Or of a mighty army cannot be defeated. It's as though if that fell, that was taken, somehow the empire itself could fall. Well, again, if that's all Jerusalem was, let it fall. Let it fall. Tragically, for so many, for so many Jews, for so many Israelites, that's all it was. It was the standard. It was the banner. It was symbolic of their power. It was symbolic of the presence of the Lord to conquer all their foes. And so, 
you can read. For example, in Jeremiah, where they speak these who were actually false prophets and said, and Jeremiah spoke of them, he said, they dressed the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, all is well, all is well in Jerusalem. Even though Jerusalem at that time was surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's armies. Peace, peace, they say, where there is no peace. Jeremiah goes on to say, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them. Yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Can't happen. It's Jerusalem, the golden. It's God's city. Can't happen. The Lord won't let it happen. Just like in a previous time, and we um, had a message recently, or a few weeks back, on this, when the Philistines were beating the Israelite army many centuries before, before even David became king, even before Samuel was uh, raised up, as it were. And the people, they came back from a severe defeat to the Philistines, and they said, what are we going to do? Let's get the Ark of God, said someone. So they did, they fetched the Ark of God. Brought it into the camp. And there was such a cheering, such a banging, that even the Philistines could hear it. They said, what has happened? They were told, a God has come into the camp. <gasps> it filled the Philistines with fear, because a God had come into the camp. But you see, they were depending, the Israelites, upon this uh, symbol, in a sense, the ark. And so somehow having this with them meant that automatically God must defend them. Even though their lives were not worthy of being defended. Even though they were not seeking God in the right way. And they thought that having the ark would be their means of rescue. But it wasn't. It wasn't. And so it was for Jerusalem. So it was for Zion at this time. Sixth century. And you find that the sin of the people is so bad, their idolatry is so bad, that the Lord who has warned them again and again and again and again and again, has sent prophet after prophet to them. Some they've stoned, some they've sawn in two, some they've chucked out. Yet they haven't repented. And so the Lord has said, enough. Jerusalem will be destroyed. Point being, for those who said that this can't happen, they would say, well look, if, if Jerusalem, if, if Zion is a symbol of the presence of God on earth, if Zion is destroyed, where now is God's symbol? Where is now is the symbol of God's presence on earth? But I suggest to you that Zion, Jerusalem, was more than a symbol. More than a symbol of God's presence. I would suggest to you that Zion, the temple of God, that Jerusalem, the city of God, that these places, this place, let's call it as one, Jerusalem, this was the very place where God dwelt with man. The very place. His very real presence was there. More than a symbol. God was present there. And yet, because of their sin, God's presence was to be and was being withdrawn. If you turn to Jeremiah and chapter 25. I won't read the start of it, but that, in a sense, builds it up because it talks about Nebuchadnezzar coming to Jerusalem, coming to Judah. Um, but go to verse 4. Though the Lord has sent all his servants, the prophets, to you again and again, you have not listened or paid any attention. They said, turn now each of you from your evil ways and your evil practices, and you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not follow other gods to serve and worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with what your hands have made. 
Then I will not harm you. But you did not listen to me, declares the Lord. And you have provoked me with what your hands have made. And you have brought harm to yourselves. Therefore the Lord Almighty says this. Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the earth. And my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon declares the Lord. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy, of, uh, sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And so this was something that had been forewarned. You read Deuteronomy chapter 28, a long chapter. But you read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and you see the uh, promise of blessing for those who are obedient to God. But the promise of curse for those who are disobedient. And that's the promise of the curse is a far lengthier part of the chapter. God will not relent. He's long-suffering. But he will not relent bringing judgment upon his stubborn and his irreligious and his idolatrous people. And that is what happened to Israel. Northern Kingdom was destroyed. Judah remained. That went into exile because they would not repent. And what the psalmist is crying out for here, the psalmist is yearning that God would come back, would restore Jerusalem, would come back, bring his presence back to Zion. You read in Ezekiel and you read this horrific uh, passage of how the glory of the Lord left the temple and then the glory of the Lord left Jerusalem. And that marks the occasion of the exile into Babylon because of the sin of the people. The psalmist is yearning that the Lord would bring back his presence. Now of course God is omniscient, he is everywhere by his spirit and he is definitely, very definitely with his people with believers when they were in exile, very definitely, because he's everywhere by his spirit. But Jerusalem represented God's home on earth, where his presence was very real. And now that is gone. The psalmist longs that that presence would come back again. And that would result in vitality for the believer again. Now, of course, he lived and we live in a fallen world. And it's a world of darkness. It's a world that is dominated, as it were, ruled, as it were, by the prince of darkness, by the devil, by Satan. And the cities of the world, though they might have their lights, natural lights, spiritually speaking, they are in total darkness. So the world is in darkness except for one place. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city on a hill. It is a light to the world. It shines forth. A light. The light of God's glory. But if God's presence is gone, then Jerusalem too is in darkness. And while that is so, while that is so, there can be no hope. No hope for the world. No hope for Judah. No hope for anyone. Where now the promise of God? Where now the promise of God to send a Messiah into the world? If Jerusalem is no more, if the temple is gone, then such a promise cannot come to pass. There can be no saviour. There can be nowhere on this world where the light of God shines. Because Jerusalem was the appointed place at that time for the presence, the very presence of God. But what you have in this psalm, I would suggest, is a, a classic case of evangelical contradiction. 
That's my own concept, um, but as I unpack it, I think you'll agree with me, it's a, a concept that other people would um, go along with. Evangelical contradiction. The psalmist, it's in two parts, isn't it? Verses 1 to 11 is despair. And verses 12 onwards, there's this, not subtle change, it's a, <laughs> a tremendous change. Gone is all the uh, self-focus. Gone is all the despair. And there is, in the second part, uh, a, a glorious, not just hope, more than a hope, a certainty of triumph. But in the first part, if you only had the first part, you would read and you would say, well, here's this psalmist who is desperate. His pleas are very, very urgent. He seems to be almost on the borders of death because of the anguish that has gripped him. So you'd say, oh, poor, poor man. Poor man, he, he had no certainty. No certainty. He's been crying out to the Lord, but he's got no certainty that the Lord's going to answer. And he's getting worse and worse with whatever it is that's troubling him. And he's on the very borders, very edge of death. He might as well give up. Perhaps he's about to give up. That's the, the kind of tone of the first 11 verses, isn't it? Yet in the second part... Beginning from that verse 12. God is eternal. God's name endures through every generation. And God will rebuild his house. For now is the time. Verse 12. But you, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. He is enthroned as king of kings with eternal power. Almighty power. In verse 13 you read, you will arise. Not you might. Not I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Not I hope that you will. Not all oh, there's some big baddies around but maybe you're strong enough. You will arise. And have compassion on Zion. Remember it's the Lord who is the one. Because of your great wrath. You have taken me up and thrown me aside. Read it like Jerusalem speaking. You've taken me up. You've taken the believers up. And say, thrown them aside. Because of the tangleweed of unbelief. Of idolatry. You will arise. And have compassion on Zion. You see, the God of justice will have justice, but he's also a God of compassion. He's also a God of mercy. And he will come back to them in mercy. The only reason he can relent his hand of judgment, the only reason the whole of Judah, the whole of Israel was not annihilated forever and ever, is because of the coming one, because of the blood of Christ. If there was no blood of Christ, there would not have been, at this time or any other time, any mercy for Jerusalem, any mercy for Israel, any mercy for anyone, because it could not be, because the justice of God is an eternal justice. And so therefore, the suffering, the punishment that comes as a consequence of sin must be everlasting. But then you have the compassion and mercy of God, and that too is everlasting. And as we saw last week, righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Justice and mercy have met at the cross. And both are satisfied. So the love of God acts in justice upon the nation of Israel. But then acts in mercy upon the nation of Israel. Then in verse 14, in verse 15, you read, well let me know just before that, the appointed time has come. What does he mean by that, the appointed time? What's he saying when he says that God's appointed time has come? Of course, if you turn back to that passage in Jeremiah, it says, this whole country, in verse 11, will become a wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are, fu are fulfilled, he goes on to speak about the punishment of Babylon. And you read in other places, 
that he goes on to speak, that the Lord, uh, through the writers, goes on to speak about the deliverance of Jerusalem. Seventy years of famine, we might say. Seventy years of blight. Seventy years of the wrath of God upon Jerusalem. But at the end of seventy years, I will bring back the exile. I will return them to Jerusalem. They will rebuild Zion. Jerusalem will stand once again. My presence will be there. That's the promise of God. Verse 14, verse 15. For her stones are dear to your servants. Her very dust moves them to pity. The nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the kings of the earth will revere your glory. These are Will's words. Not Will as in Williams, but Will. This will happen. It is Will, it is Will. Christ, I will go to Jerusalem. I will go to the cross. I will die. And I will, after three days, rise again. I think it's the five I wills I once titled a sermon I preached on uh, from one of the passages that, that has that verse in there. It's going to happen. And it happened. And here, the psalmist says, it's going to happen. Yet he's almost dead with despair and anguish. Yet he knows it's going to happen. What's going on? When it happens, of course, verses 14 and 15 tells us that the whole world will have to say, "'Tis the Lord, tis the Lord who's done this." Verse 16 again reminds us that it's certain the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in His glory. There you are, the glory is gone, but the glory will come back again, it's certain. And in verse 27, the verse, first part of that, it says, "'You remain the same.'" God is unchangeable. So it's not like the psalmist is saying, Lord, you, you promised this once, but I'm not sure now if you really mean it, because I know how, you know how often you change your mind. You remain the same. God is unchanging. What he has said, it will be. And at the start of Ezra, uh, you read just that. That in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. And if you read through there, you see the list of the things they were to bring back to Jerusalem and the peoples that were to come back. And it's basically the fulfillment of prophecy. God stirs the heart of Cyrus. To say, let those people go. Let those people go. It's as though God says to Cyrus, let my people go. And Cyrus says, you can go. But he doesn't just send them away. He sends them with his blessing, as it were, royal blessing. He sends them back with all the things that were stolen. And he sends them back to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. So that the presence of God may have a home on earth once again. So if he's so sure that this is going to happen, why is the psalmist, why is he so distressed? What's up with him? Well, I would suggest it's called a burden. That what the psalmist has is a burden. And more than just a burden, it's the burden of God. The burden of God has come upon the psalmist. That is what has happened. When the Lord raises a person for a task, he first burdens them for it. So for an example, with an immediate task, something desperate that needed doing there and then, David, before Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who defies the armies of the living God, said, we'll call him little David, because he's still only young. Goliath. Was he over eight foot tall, wasn't he? Over nine foot tall. The burden of the Lord is upon David. He sees the shrinking army of Israel all carrying away, knees knocking. He sees this well, giant of a man. But he doesn't see the giant. He just sees the despair in the people and the fear in the people. And he's moved, he's burdened by this. This can't happen. What, 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 what will happen to the person who slays this 
uncircumcised Philistine. Well, he'll get this and he'll get that. He's not really worried about what he'll get. He'll just, is there anything I'm going to do? Right, well, I'm, you know, take me, I'm not going to do that again. I did it last week. <laughs> I'll take a chat. I'll go in there. And he does. And he destroys them. There's that immediate burn. Then you look at the life of, as I've been reading your excerpts from, someone like Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor, from a very early age, had this burn to be a missionary. But not just, Lord, where will you send me? He had a burden to go to China. And it was with him from a very early age. And his whole life, as a consequence, in the lead up to that, and I think the best part of his biography, for me personally, is before he goes, that I find the most stimulating, the most, in, most encouraging, the most challenging, is because there he's, he's sort of, he's testing his faith, as it were. His faith is growing, all the dross is being removed. And everything he does is with that one aim, to go to China and be a missionary. And there he serves in a glorious way, yes. But you look beforehand, this burden upon him. Or you take William Carey, a generation or so before. If God wants to convert the heathen man, he'll do it himself. He doesn't need to send you. Be quiet. That's what Carey was told when he um, was trying to challenge the church of his day that we need to do something about the heathen in the world. We need to see if we can't send missionaries. He was burdened. So if you said to him, all right, it's all right, well, you talk a good talk, mate, but what are you going to do about it? Well, he actually put on his jacket. And he got on the boat. And he went. And he never came back again. Because he was burdened. Because God placed that burden on him. Now, if it was of man, it would have fallen to the ground. It would have fallen to the ground. It's one of the great truths that we get from the Acts, isn't it? From a person who we could say, is he a believer? Probably not. But he speaks in such a way, such a wise way. When they're opposing the apostles and saying, the, the uh, Sanhedrin, and they're, they're trying to persecute them, as it were. And he says, leave them alone. Leave them alone. If what they're doing is of men, it will fall to the ground. It will prove to be nothing. Look at so-and-so. He was a somebody for some time. Where is he now? Look at that one. What happened to him? But if it's of God... Why? Because God will fulfill his promise. And when he puts that burden on a person, if it's of God, then it will come to pass. And it will grip them so much, I would go so far as to say that the very words in the psalm, the first part of the psalm there, may well be the experience, the burden that is on a person when God is doing something new, that's something he hasn't perhaps done for many generations. Cannot eat, cannot sleep. Overcome with grief and with suffering and with distress. So the Lord, before he raises, or when he's raising someone for a task, he burdens them for it. But also, before any major action that God does, he moves his people to prayer. That is what he is doing in this psalm. He is moving the psalmist to do that. Seventy years? Why does Jeremiah, why is Jeremiah given the prophecy of seventy years? Why? On the one hand, it's to encourage the Israelites when they're going into slavery. Because Jeremiah, part of his message was, go. Go, it wasn't so much slavery. It was, it was uh, into exile. And let's leave it at that. Because for many, it was actually quite a wealthy existence there. They got into business and all sorts of things. And they made money. And they were happy in a sense, in a measure there. And so part of Jeremiah's message was, look, don't resist. Don't resist Nebuchadnezzar and his armies. This is of God. Go. It's too late now. It's too late now to undo the sin of before. So go. But be encouraged by this. Though it may not be you because your three score and ten is nearing its end. Your future offspring or your uh, future generations, they will come back 70 years and the Lord will return and he will bring you back to this land, this land of promise. That was one of the reasons. But the other reason for it being there was 
in order that God's people, 70 years hence, in reading of such things, would be stirred to pray. Lord, surely now is the time to show favour. The appointed time has come. That is what the psalmist says there in verse 13. Now is the time. I'm burdened by it. You put this burden upon me, Lord, to fulfil what you have promised. Or again, you can read Daniel. Daniel was one in exile. In the first year of a particular reign, I, Daniel, stood from the, uh, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord, given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Daniel's read that in prophecy. He's calculating. He thought, hang on a minute. 70 years are up. What does he do? Does he jump up and down and say, oh, I can't wait to see what's going to happen? This is what he does. Daniel 9, verse 3. He says, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition. He didn't just say, Restore, O Lord, the honour of your name. Amen. He pleaded with the Lord in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Yet God was going to do it anyway. But you see, this is the sovereignty of God. He includes us. He includes his people in his sovereign actions. It's a marvellous thing, isn't it? God doesn't need us. Yet he uses us. Here's an abomination for you. I don't know whether it's still going on now, but in the charismatic movement, or a certain wing of it, extreme wing of it at one time, there was um, a, a, a situation, well, I say a situation, this has happened, on more than one occasion, but there was a, a move, as it were, wherein you'd have a group of, um, I'll, I'll say so-called Christians, because I don't know where they're at, but you'd have a group of so-called Christians gathering together in so-called prayer, and you'd have grown men, legs apart, a colleague of mine said, what are you doing? What is that noise? I'm birthing something. I'm birthing something. Now there's a measure of truth in that. But it's an abomination. The measure of truth is this. That when God is going to do something, he brings that burden upon his people for it. And so the cry could almost be a... Because you long so much for it to be so. But let me tell you of a difference. One significant difference, there are many, but one significant difference is this. That young man who was making a fool of himself did not know what he was doing it for. But here, the psalmist... There, the would-be missionary. There, the would-be one-day king. They knew, Daniel knew, what he was pouring his heart out for. And when God burdens his people for something, he doesn't keep them into the, in the dark as to what it is. That doesn't mean to say they know exactly what's going to happen. Of course they know. It doesn't mean to say they know the timing. Here they did, because that was prophesied. It just means that they're burdened with the state of something. That they're burdened with the way things are. That they're burdened about a particular thing. They're burdened with something that they feel needs to be done. And they cry out to the Lord. That's the difference. It's as though they experience the anguish of the Lord. They show God's anguish, just as Jerusalem, Jerusalem showed God's presence. They show God's anguish. His concern is worked out through them. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He broke down and wept. Why? Because he was burdened. He was filled with the anguish. He saw the grief. He knew what he was going to do. He knew Lazarus wasn't going to stay dead in the tomb. But he saw the grief of those around and it moved him at their plight. It moved him at their suffering. And so we move to us. 
That's the psalmist. That's Jerusalem. By the way, if you don't know your Bible history, Cyrus, his action was fulfilled. And 44, 45,000 and some hundred returned to Jerusalem. And by and by the temple was rebuilt. By and by, God's presence on earth, in a sense, was once again restored. But so to us, we live in a nation over which, if we are a Christian, we should grieve. We should grieve very much. And I would suggest that the Lord grieves at the sin of our nation. But our nation is part of this world that is a fallen world, that is a world that lives in darkness. In its present form, this world is condemned. It will not last forever. And all who remain holy and only a part of this world, this age, will be condemned with it. Many Christians, if you read your church history, have been burdened for the state of their particular nation, not least this nation, but their particular nation, down through the years, down through the centuries. They've been burdened for it. And God has used their prayer, or God has used their subsequent action, having burdened them in the first place. And it's brought about a great deliverance for the particular nation. But I would suggest to you this morning that if you're a Christian, your first concern today should not be for the nation, but it should be, as a psalmist, for the church. For the church. Jerusalem was a light to the world. It was one light in a world of darkness. Jerusalem was the place where God was present in his glory. One light. The church is a light that spreads to every nation. Jerusalem was localised. The church is international. And we believe, the Bible teaches, that God by his spirit doesn't now dwell in a building, a temple, however nice it might be, however expensive the glass cost. He dwells within the body of his people, the church of God. And so I would suggest to you this morning that what we need in our nation is not so much, yes, we should be concerned about the, the nation, but our primary concern is with the church. Because this represents God's presence on earth. And without the presence of God on earth, the world can only remain in darkness. We saw recently in Ephesians, in chapter 3, that the church was to be used to enlighten the world. The world that was in darkness. If the light of the church is merely a little flicker, how can a world in darkness be able to use the light of the church to understand the word of God? It's a noble book. It's a rich book. It's a great cultural, not discovery, because it's always been with us, but it's a great cultural tool. It's a great um, resource for understanding the ancient world. And how people used to think and how they used to worship and this kind of thing. What a good, glorious book it is. But that's all it can be. Because I'm in darkness. I need light to see. And God in his sovereignty... And in his wisdom has chosen the church to be the light. To be the light to the world. To be the city on a hill. And if we are but a flicker, how can this book be anything more 
How can there be anything more to discover in it than a bit of cultural past? The church is now the main presence of God on earth. when the church is shining brightly will the world be converted now there is a danger we have on our notices constant prayer for revival next Saturday morning I don't know um, whether you plan to attend that whether though you can't because of circumstance whether you join with that um, uh, the spirit of that as it were and pray on your own at home or with someone else at home or when you're out and about whether you join in in that way but there's a danger with this constant prayer for revival as it's called of it simply becoming another doing another thing that's on the church calendar I'm doing my little bit like a cleaning day or a women's this day or a man's that day if that's all it is we might as well have a jungle sale and be done with it there's a danger of becoming my doing my little bit I go along I say my prayer I'm a bit stirred by things yes but then I go away and I forget about it because I've patted myself on the back God is pleased with me because I, I went, do you know, I, I haven't got a 100% attendance record. I thought I had a 100% attendance record. I nearly had a 100% attendance record at these prayer meetings for revival. But if you have, you can give yourself a jolly good pat on the back. Because I've given myself a nice pat on the back because I've been to almost all of them. If that's all it is, forget it. Forget it. That's a danger, isn't it? In verse 20, the psalmist says how a future generation um, will hear this written. That God heard the groans of the prisoners and released those condemned to death. Now I've already said to you, and if you know your history, that in exile, in Babylon, many Jews flourished. They were told to go there and do that. Build houses. Settle down. Prosper. I'll bless you. They were told to do that. So it wasn't prison for them. It wasn't poverty for many of them. Ah, but though they have those things, outwardly, though they be blessed in that way, those who were truly the Lord's people were imprisoned. They were mourning. They were in grief because they wanted to be back to their homeland. And they wanted to be back to where they knew the presence of God dwelt. And so they were suffering. True Israel mourned. Now there may be many in the church who might be content that there are people condemned to death. That they might be content that they've got their um, allotted place, they've got their satisfaction with this and with that. They might be content. Even though all around there are people dying and heading to judgment. Now on this constant prayer, if you've been, you might agree with me, there have been some good meetings. Some good meetings. Some impassioned, pleased before the Lord. One or two people have been in tears, noticeably in tears. But there's always a caution. I always want to put a caution. Because when someone is weeping, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the Lord that's stirring them. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the burden of the Lord upon them. Some people are more emotional than others. I can assure you today that if you see me weeping on this, uh, from this pulpit, it can only be the Lord, because I am not like that. Was the psalmist like that? He might have been. But here, it was more than that. It was more than his own mere emotion. It was the burden of God that was upon him. It was given by God. And that is what we need. We need God's burden upon us. And then we can ask the question, will the Lord answer? Will the Lord answer? Well, the psalmist believed it was so. 
God had promised the psalmist that it would be so. Verse 18, it was to be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. They would praise the Lord because what they would because of what they would see, um, or because they would see what had been done. But then in verse 21 and 22, the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion, his praise in Jerusalem, and the peoples and the kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord. There will be praise from future generations for what God has done. Praise from the church, in a sense. But that also should be an encouragement for us when we read of such things. When we see that that did happen. It's an encouragement for us that God has said, I will build my church. I will build my church. And surely our plea can be, Lord, you're not building it. You're not building it in our land, in our generation. Lord, will you not honour your promise and build your church? What more is it to say? Except to urge you to ask for it. To ask for God's burden upon you. God's burden for the revival of his church. It is only when the church is revived that the nation can flourish. And live in such a way that he might give it to you. That burden. If he gives it to one person then their prayer will see that it comes as well to others. That is how it has been in revival. That is how it has been in days gone by. But be encouraged. Be encouraged as well because many Christians are asking. They are asking. Maybe they're not asking directly for this burden. They're asking God to come back to his church. They're asking for it. Do any have it? Do any Christians in our day and generation have this burden, such as we read of here with the psalmist? Do any you know have such a burden? Are any experiencing sleepless nights? Are any experiencing a loss of appetite? Or any experience in almost physical pain. Their minds, their bodies reduced to agony. Not because of some mere physical illness, which we all suffer with from time to time. But because the burden of God for his church, for our generation, is upon them. Now we sung Jerusalem the golden, wasn't it? Those were the words, I believe. Verses 25 to 27. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth. God is the creator once. And the heavens and the earth are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. God is eternal. They will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them. In other words, they will be recreated. The old will be discarded. You remain the same. Your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. Now, its primary focus is, of course, the day it was written and for the people of the coming generations. But we can use our telescope now. And we can put out our telescope to its farthest distance, as it were, and look to the farthest horizons. And we can see, looming on that horizon, the new Jerusalem, the city golden, that which is to come, the age which is to come, and that which is certain, our home forever, to be with the Lord. The presence of God was local in Jerusalem, it's international in the church, and it will be universal in the future. All through Christ, the Emmanuel. The reason why all of this must, at the time of the psalmist, be rebuilt and come again. In order that Christ could come that first time. And 
Just as God's promise was fulfilled then, we have his sure and certain promise that I will return, says the Lord. And the church, in the interim, while we await his return, the church is the voice of God in our day and generation. Unless the Holy Spirit is upon his church, then the voice that we have to the nation. If we're not giving in to the ways of the world, the voice that we have and the mouth that we have to the nation will be one of merely condemning, condemning the world, sounding like killjoys, because we've nothing better to offer. Some silly story about a man who died and you claim his rose risen again. What a silly story is that? Come on, we've moved on from all of that. You're just condemning me. You're just killing my joy. I want to live and be happy and live and express myself how I want to. And your old ways that have passed, they're not going to stop me. Church is the voice of God. What we need is the Holy Spirit in our voice. Then whether we rise up to speak of coming judgments or whether we sound forth the loving sound, the loving cry, let's say, of mercy and of peace and of reconciliation with God. The world will sit up and take notice because it has to, because it must, because no one can resist God, because He is irresistible. And what we need is the irresistible one to bless us, that we might be a blessing to the world. The moment the world suppresses all thought of God and will continue to do so. There's an interesting email that came to me, I think I saw it this morning, an email this morning from someone who's uh, responsible for coordinating this concert of prayer for revival, I believe, and he's saying an email may have gone out talking about um, homosexual marriage and such like, and um, it wasn't from us. And what he wanted to point out was that the writer was using Romans 1, verse 18 on, to say how this is evidence, what's happening today with the uh, legalising of uh, gay marriage, as they call it, the legalising of gay marriage, this is evidence of God withdrawing his presence from our nation. But the second email that went out, went on to say, that is not our understanding of Romans. And what he said I thought was glorious. Because I believe that that is true. That when we see certain things going on that are spoken of there in Romans chapter 1. When we see such things, that is clear evidence of God's withdrawing his presence. It says so in Romans. But again, you don't just take one chapter and isolate it. You read the book as a whole. When you get to chapter 3 verse 9, you read that Jew and Gentiles alike are all under sin. Paul is building an argument. He's showing how all the world is sinful. All are under sin. But then in Romans 11:32, and this was quoted on the email, Paul says this, For God has bound all men over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. And that is our encouragement when we see our land. Yes, God has and is withdrawing his presence. But look at what happens before there's a mighty wave that crashes onto the shore. The shingle that's at the edge of the sea is drawn outwards, isn't it? It's drawn outwards by a large pool, as it were. And it's taken a long, long way out before the wave comes with tumultuous power to crash it forward to the very seawall itself. And so the signs in our land but also and more importantly in our church the church of this land is of a shingle as it were being swept out and make it your prayer. Lord, let there be 
be a coming wave to crash once again. Probably not the right choice of word, crash, but to, to rebuild once again. Rebuild your church. Well, I end there just to say this. Are you asking God to give you that burden? Amen.